What is going on, everybody? Welcome into the week six NFL Power Rankings show. Can you believe we're a third of the way through the season already? It always goes way too fast, but I'm feeling really good about the rankings here this week as we start to really learn who these teams are and sort through all of the madness. I'm really excited to hear what you guys think of the rankings this week. Definitely let me know in the comments down below. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Please do hit that like button as we dive in. It really helps me out. But here we go. At the very bottom, keeping this as the currently unserious tier, the New England Patriots claiming the bottom spot where I had them coming into the year. Very little to say about them. They keep losing key players. Jabril Pepper is now a legal situation. You hate to see that. And you hate to see them saying they might start Drake May. Ah, even if it isn't this week, I hate the fact that they maybe are thinking about it. Give the man a red shirt season. You are going to Bryce Young his ass if you throw him out there behind this situation and waste a perfectly good number three overall draft pick. As someone that really liked Drake May, I'm terrified that they are going to break and bend him backwards uh, by putting him out there. Speaking of the team that just broke a high-end draft pick, the Carolina Panthers at number 31. The offense takes a step back in Chicago this week, but God, this, this defense is just so bad, and they keep losing players too. Jadavion Clowney gets hurt in this game, and the one good thing this offense really had going for them was the offensive line, and Austin Corbett, a bicep injury. The curse on this team just continues to pound them into the dirt. Panthers dropping a spot in the rankings this week. Then at number 30, the Miami Dolphins picking up a scrappy win over the Patriots. Uh, the, the way this game ended with a fullback dive, go-ahead touchdown at the end, couldn't have been more fitting to describe that game. Um, Miami will see a big boost up in these rankings whenever Tua comes back. I think we might be a week or two away from that. So it's great for them to get a win to keep their season alive. But am I taking them really any more seriously after beating the Patriots? Barely? No, not really. But then at number 29, the Cleveland Browns. It really is just a shame to see the season wasted with ownership not willing to basically admit their mistake on Deshaun Watson. It couldn't be any more obvious that A, he sucks. He's like the 50th best quarterback, maybe, in the league right now. Um, but he's also quit on this team. And it's just the locker room dysfunction, the finger pointing. It just has to stop. It's clearly derailing any good thing that this team has. Like, I just don't think this defense is playing as hard knowing what they, they see going on in the offensive side of the ball. It's a sham, and it's a shame. So the Browns just continue to fall here in the rankings. If you want any positive for the Browns, it's at least they have their own first round pick this year. Then the Tennessee Titans uh, gaining a spot on the bye week this week. I did get a laugh out of everybody saying Jordan Love still managed to give us a Will Levis with the pick six desperation heave falling down in the back of his own end zone. Um, yeah, that's basically the most we heard from the Titans this week. Now, before we jump up to our next tier here, in this spooky month of October, Underdog Fantasy is running their Boost-tober promotion where every single day you can get a token for an even larger profit boost for your Pick'em contests. I love a good pun, can definitely appreciate the promo, but I also love playing Pick'em on Underdog where you string together your lineup, selecting player stats higher or lower, and these contests keep you glued to your seat towards the end of any given football game you're watching with a chance at massive payouts. Payouts that now with the Boosttober promotion can be even bigger. So right now, if you sign up using promo code TFG at Underdog, they will give you a bonus match up to $1,000 and you will support my channel in the process. That is promo code TFG at Underdog. And let's now get to our next tier in the power rankings. So our next tier is the frisky tier, and that is going to start with the ever frisky Las Vegas Raiders, seemingly um, not so competitive this week. They end up switching quarterbacks away from Gardner Minshew. I, I don't think that's really the problem or the solution, but maybe it would be more fun to see O'Connell. I, I don't know, man. Rough loss this week against the Broncos. Way too many turnovers. Uh, felt like every time I looked over, Pat Sertan or Riley Moss was catching the ball, not the Raiders receivers. But hey, a great week for the New York Giants. They climbed a two and three. They're going to gain a couple spots in the power rankings. Uh, credit to Giants fans, you know, saying, 
hey, I, I think, you know, you're you're right to be upset and, and disappointed in where the Giants are, but they are hanging around in these football games and staying competitive. Well, in this game, they hang around long enough to block a kick and win the game at the end of it in that way. Daniel Jones, with the offensive line actually playing pretty well, um, has been okay. That defensive line, I do feel like, has really come alive in the last few weeks. And hey, they get some of those rookies going here, those day three rookies, Tyrone Tracy, Theo Johnson. You love to see it. Uh, Brian Dable, maybe getting a little bit of his mojo back, which is, you know, I'm really happy. I really like Brian Dable. I just want him to have a season that doesn't get him fired this year, and it definitely feels like they're building towards that. And that was all without Malik Neighbors. So I don't know if this is going to keep climbing up into like playoff contention, but definitely just building something for the Giants is great from where they've been over the last 400 days or so. But then going in the opposite direction, the New Orleans Saints, basically, I think actually exactly ranked where I had them coming into the year, three straight losses and basically all of the glow of those first two weeks has completely disappeared. Now, I do think a lot of injuries in the trenches really has derailed what they want to do offensively. They want to be able to run the ball, but when you lose two of your best linemen, your, your center, your right guard, and, and maybe even more importantly, actually losing Taysom Hill has been a big, big deal for all of the different flexible early uh, early down stuff that they liked to do with him. So they, they haven't been able to get to that. And then you're seeing Derek Carr behind a bad offensive line getting exposed and a defense that can't really get after it up front. And just a weird game against the Chiefs where I've never seen so many wide open receivers and coverage busts from a Dennis Allen defense. So the Saints are absolutely spiraling right now. And this game, frankly... <laughs> Shouldn't have even been as close as it was. Um, you know, they get a, a Juju Smith-Schuster bounce, a lucky bounce results in an interception at the one-yard line and a missed field goal. Like, they were really kind of getting beat up the whole game, in my opinion. Um, but then at number 24, the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'm glad we at least had them in the frisky tier. A lot of people thought this should be the number 32-ranked team last week, the one team without a win as of last week. But you knew something like this was possible. And, and, you know, Trevor Lawrence, they, they ended up with 38 points in this game. I think it was 37, maybe. You know, Trevor was better. He actually hit the open deep shots that were available there. You get the huge chunk plays there. Um, but this game definitely didn't feel like a 37-34 game. It was like 20 to 13 in the fourth quarter. And then it just got crazy at the end of it. I actually feel like the Jags defense has stood out as competent the last couple of weeks and the offense got some stuff going here in this one. I do think they dug deep and, um, you know, tapped into the good parts of this team to pull out a victory over the Colts, but I don't think they're through the woods yet either, right? Like they still almost blew this game. They still had multiple moments where they couldn't convert in short yardage situations um, and couldn't really put the game away uh, at the very end, which has obviously been a problem for them. So great for them to get a win. Doug Peterson saves his job for now. And Trevor, just good to get like a breath of fresh air with what was a, a very good game from Trevor Lawrence, despite a couple ugly moments, an ugly pick and a, a third down drop back that I pointed out on Twitter was just like, man, that is not a great quarterback staring down a check down with a wide open receiver behind him. But it's OK. He washed over that with a bunch of other good throws. So. Yeah, there's your Jags this week. Then the Chargers at number 23 on the bye week this week, getting a plus one. I'm excited to see what they look like coming back. Get that offensive line healthy. Hopefully Herbert can get back to full speed. And, you know, I, I think the second third of the, the, the second trimester of the season, the Chargers, uh, Chargers could make some noise here if they can get healthy. Then we have the Rams at number 22, staying put uh, a tough uh, shot at it against the Packers. Stafford's doing his best to hang in there. Um, really just some some bad turnovers kept the Rams out of this game. They had a very good chance to win. So they just, they need to buy some wins against somebody, you know, before they can get their guys back. I, I still think this team can be kind of a, you know, even a, a sleeper, you know, spoiler team in the playoffs if they could get that far. But the losses keep racking up and they just have too many holes really throughout the roster at this point with all these injuries. 
But then the Indianapolis Colts at number 21, they fall down a spot. Uh, really a weird team to truly know who they are right now. Very quarter to quarter, frankly. Um, it's it's not great to say that Joe Flacco is giving them a better option at quarterback right now than Anthony Richardson, because Flacco actually played really well in this game against the Jags, but they obviously want to go back to Anthony Richardson as soon as possible, because that's really all that matters this year. So, you know, the offense is still kind of in evaluation mode, slash we don't really know what we're going to get from them from week to week, who the quarterback's going to be how they're going to play if it is Anthony Richardson. Um, injuries are piling up on the offense as well, which you don't love. Will Fries, their right guard, who was having a great season, goes down for the year. Jonathan Taylor not out there. You definitely felt that in the run game. Trey Sermon's just not Jonathan Taylor. And defensively, I mean, they have their moments, and then they just have these massive gaffes where they give up big plays. So um, just a very kind of weird, unpredictable average football team right now to round out the frisky tier but then how about those cardinals kicking off the fringe playoff caliber tier bouncing back from a rough couple of weeks remember we had the cardinals in this tier several weeks ago after that dismantling of the la rams and they really settled in and dug deep to get this win as a team. I, you know, they they got some breaks. The Jordan Mason fumble and the Niners not having a field goal kicker was really the difference in this game. But Kyler playing great again, you know, hitting the big throw to Marvin Harrison in a big spot on fourth and five in a way that he hadn't been doing in some big third downs the last couple of weeks. But the defense doing enough to keep them around against a, an explosive Niners offense, uh, just enough to kind of scrap out this win, even if it wasn't the most impressive individual win for how the game went and they got some lucky breaks. It was in San Francisco against the 49ers, mostly at full strength. So definitely some credit to go towards Arizona. And I do think they have the horses offensively to be a tough out against anybody and have earned this place inside the top 20. Then we got the Chicago Bears at number 19. You know, beating the Panthers at home, I don't want to give them too much credit, but I do feel like Caleb, he's just building performances on top of each other. Ugly start, now to the point here, week five. He looks the part, man. They are asking a lot out of him. He's going through his progressions. He's taking care of the football. His elite pocket presence from college is absolutely translating the way he can manage the pocket. He had five or six ridiculous scrambles in this game. He's making pre-snap checks um, and the accuracy starting to show up, dropping a dime down the field to DJ Moore on a throw that he had been missing out the gate. So that's big news for the Bears. It was against the Panthers who are currently fielding a XFL roster defensively. So we got to see them continue to do this against real defenses. Um, but yeah, Bears are definitely trending in the right direction. Then we got the Denver Broncos at 18. They are really roaring right now. Um, Bo Nix continues to play very solid, but this to me continues to just be about Vance Joseph and this defense. Pat Sertan legitimately in the defensive player of the year conversation right now, I think. Um, shut down Garrett Wilson, shut down Mike Evans in two big wins for this Broncos team, and now a two-interception game against the Raiders. But you've also got Riley Moss breaking out this year. He gets an interception. I mean, you give Sean Payton a top-five defense, he can work with that. I don't think this is like a Super Bowl contender or anything, but you you know, if if teams vying for AFC playoff positioning like I don't know, the Bengals, the Steelers, the Bills. If they let the Broncos hang around, they might you know, sneak in there and steal that seven seed from some more potent teams in the league. But then at number 17, I do have the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's it's funny how when they were 3-0, and Steelers fans were like, how is this not a top 10 team? They're undefeated. And I'm like, we do this every year with the Steelers. This is the same exact Steelers team we've grown to know and love and oftentimes hate feels like they have floated between 12 and 20 for a half a decade at this point i just don't know if there is an end in sight to that right now i do want to talk about justin fields the steelers do get a minus three this week in the rankings at least through three and a half 
weeks, really. You know, last week was up and down. Um, but you felt like, okay, you know, maybe Fields is becoming a new man. And, um, you know, even if this team is boring in terms of what their end results might be this season, can, can Fields turn into something that people have always wanted him to become? And he just looks like good old bad Justin Fields in this game against Dallas. And it's not like Dallas was putting up that much resistance, right? They're out the, every edge rusher that they wanted to roster this year. Their secondary is beat up and, and just not anything special. And Fields is out there holding the ball too long, passing up wide open throws over the middle of the field, really regressing back to the old Justin Fields. Um, and their run game hasn't been as impressive as it was in the first few weeks. So the offense isn't helping the defense as much. And when you keep Dallas around long enough with a, with a combination of Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb, they're going to find a way to win that game against you. So they're in the mix. They're tough. They're the Steelers. Um, but as this heading back towards Russell Wilson coming in and you lose that kind of excitement, that what if on Justin Fields, I don't know. We'll see. Then we got the Atlanta Falcons at number 16. What a night against the Bucks. Um, and, and the Falcons kind of right back to where I had them ranked heading into the year. And I think that's perfect because this is the version of the Falcons I fully expected to see this year where Kirk kind of gets locked in. You're utilizing Drake London, Kyle Pitts. Bijan's actually been quiet the last couple of weeks. I think that can change. And it just took the Falcons a little while to get there. I do think what we're seeing is pretty legit. Like I think Kirk week to week to week has just felt more comfortable being on more of the same page with these receivers. I think over the last two weeks, they've really learned how to use Drake London. And even last week, they started to get some touches for Kyle Pitts. Like, that's a big, big deal. And I think that's real. And hey, who doesn't love to have also one of the clutchest quarterbacks in the NFL? Um, just egg on Barstool's face. He throws a, a desperation pick on 4th and 15 late in this game. And Barstool's like, oh, good old classic Kirk Cousins. I'm like, where have you guys been? Kirk has been the most clutch quarterback not named Patrick Mahomes in the NFL for the last five years. I saw him come back against the Colts 33-0 in the second half in person. That's some BS, Barstool. So love to see them get egg on their face. NFL overtime rules suck. It's a joke that in a game like that, Baker doesn't get to touch the football field. And in my mind... I do consider that a bit of an asterisk win for the Falcons. I've been consistent with that approach throughout my entire record on this channel. I just don't think it's fair that the Bucs don't get a chance. I don't need to keep going down that path. I was going on yet another rant on Twitter about it. But um, a part of this is the Falcons. Defense is as concerning as I thought it would be heading into the year. I mean, they can't generate a pass rush. The Bucs were really getting whatever they wanted with that defense. So... They are playing with fire when they got to win games 30 to 27 and oftentimes rely on winning a coin toss in overtime and, you know, late game heroics. But it is great to see kind of things working on the offensive side of the ball there. They really are like the anti Steelers. And it's funny to see those two teams at three and two right next to each other. And they couldn't be any more different from each other. But then I have the Seattle Seahawks at number 15. They got to get healthy, man, right? Like, they they don't have Byron Murphy, who's a big part of that defensive tackle group. They got to find a right tackle to get back here, whether it's George Fant or um, Abraham Lucas, because Stone Forsyth is not an answer there. Like, they got to they gotta go to the free agent block and find somebody. There's names out there, too, like Charles Leno, DJ Humphreys. They got to buy some more time for Geno Smith because he's just under way too much fire right now. And the interior is not great. Dexter Lawrence took over that game. That will happen. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to panic about the Seahawks because I am still impressed by their offense. I think um, defensively, I know I mentioned they got to get Byron Murphy back too, but but boy, Amafe also has not been available for them. Like those are probably their two best pass rushers if we're being realistic about it. Um, so I do think there's brighter days ahead for the defense as well. Um, even if they aren't, you know, the first three weeks were, were probably a little bit fraudulent based on their opponent. Um, but if they can just settle in and be a little bit better defensively, uh, I do think this team is, is right on the cusp of being a really good football team. But they're just they're just missing a little bit of something right now. Then I got the Cincinnati Bengals at one and four, moving up two spots this week. Look, this team might be in a in a boat right like a you know a, a sprint to try to get their standings back into a, a spot where they can actually be 
a playoff team. But they made it very clear this week that this offense is back and they might be one of the, if not the best offenses in the NFL right now. Joe Burrow is on a mission right now. He is hell bent to bring these Bengals back. He is balling out right now. Looks like, you know, that MVP version of Joe Burrow or MVP candidate that we saw in 2022 and maybe even a little bit better, um, just evenly distributing this ball between Jamar Chase and T. Higgins with all of these other, like they have so many more ancillary weapons as well than they had maybe in 2022. So many different guys that can hurt you. Yossi Voss, two running backs out of the backfield, a pair of tight ends. Their 12 personnel has been really good. So exciting on that side of the ball, but defensively, man, this is a disaster. Dax Hill now, who had other than Trey Hendrickson, it had probably been their best defensive player this year. Uh, was a bright spot at corner. He's down, done for the season. Just hate to see that. I'm a huge Dax Hill guy. Was loving that for him. Um, you know, they did get some new guys back in there in the D-line. Miles Murphy had a nice big pressure in this game. But um, how much is do they really need? And, and um, is, it, is it too little too late? Maybe. But... On a week-to-week basis, I-, I promise you, whether this team is 4-1 and one or 1-4, one and four, nobody wants to go against the Bengals right now. So that's what's fun about an exercise like this, is this is not NFL standings week six. This is power rankings. I think the Bengals are, um, you know, as the 14th best team in the league after giving the Ravens a real scare this week. I think that's totally justified. But the Bengals don't quite crack my playoff caliber tier. Uh, where I do have the Bucks here at 13, and this is probably the one team that I'm guessing, you know, second guessing myself on. They obviously just lost to the Falcons in Atlanta, um, but ranked three spots below them there. And, and the Falcons do have the um, the same record. And actually, if you look at like Vegas, like Atlanta is favored to win this division. So I'm kind of going against the market, going against the recency bias on this and uh, going against the grain a little bit. The Bucs are just weird. They have a pair of super impressive wins to me, right? They dismantled the Eagles last week. They went into Detroit and won. I don't forget that stuff. And really four out of five weeks, Baker has played like a, a great, like top 10 quarterback. They've used Chris Godwin and Mike Evans and really made a lot of noise offensively. They have horses coming back to so many injuries right now on both sides of the ball they've been without Luke Gedeke and and the offensive line uh, top 10 to 15 right tackle in the league they're also expecting to get back a couple of um, underrated backup receivers for them or or complimentary receivers both the rookie McMillan and Trey Tucker who's a great deep threat for them he really is um, and then defensively, like, God, they're, Antoine Winfield should be back soon. Kalijah Kansi should be back soon. Like, they have guys just on the cusp of coming back. I, it feels like it might be next week, the week after that. So they're, they're the last team in this playoff caliber tier, but they have impressed me more than underwhelmed me. Obviously frustrating that they weren't able to close that game out against the the Falcons there. The Minnesota accent came out real bad on that out, but we'll leave it for fun. Um, yeah, t- tough to get a loss in that way, uh, but I'm, I'm not terribly worried about the Bucks, who I just put up into the top 10 after destroying the Eagles a week before. Then I've got the Jets at number 12 at 2 and 3. I know people are tired of me making excuses and defending the Jets, but... I'm just trying to stay honest about this. I do feel like they're really close. And they gave the Vikings the best run for the for the Vikings money this season. They were as close to beating Minnesota as anybody else. Honestly, I mean, we can talk about the offense, but a key reason that I believe the Jets are so close is this defense has been that Jets defense that we expected them to be since week one, where they ran into a buzzsaw against the Niners and got ran over. Um, again, with the Minnesota O's, they, it's crazy. Uh, but... <laughs> Um, they have been a great defense. And that's why I, I have a hard time being too hard on Robert Sala because he has found those answers and had some really good game plans, um, you know, to, to, to come out and, and ball out on that side of the ball. Offensively, they are going through it right now. There's no denying it. Really underwhelmed and disappointed in, in Rogers' ability to attack the blitz over the last couple of weeks. That's definitely a concern. I do think he's getting probably a little too much hate, which is 
not unfamiliar territory for Aaron Rodgers, but there's a lot of good quarterbacking going on from him this year too. Not elite or great quarterbacking, but he's still um, giving the Jets something they've never had before, really. The main problem here with the Jets is they've constructed this offense to be so dependent on Rodgers and his crazy but effective, like, chemistry style timing style offense based on his pre-snap checks a lot of those chemistry balls like the interception to mike williams where he's throwing it expecting williams to look early find the ball sooner and and he doesn't and the throw ends up obviously looking way worse than it was supposed to be when rogers isn't doing what mike williams is expecting him to do but you can also argue like okay number one Mike Williams probably isn't the receiver in a big spot for you to be trusting on a throw like that, Aaron. And number two, it's Aaron's fault that this is how the offense is constructed, right? Like he wants Alan Lazard there. He wants Nathaniel Hackett there too. So I understand why Rodgers is taking all the heat. It's a very nuanced conversation there. But I do think these are things that will only get better in time. And hell, if they had Devontae Adams, that would fix a lot of that chemistry stuff. They got to find a way to run the ball better, too. That's that's probably the biggest issue with the Jets' offense right now, if we're being honest about it, is Brees Hall has been one of the worst running backs in the league this year. And they just don't have a play caller to help provide answers here. So I understand the frustrations with the Jets. They And they are certainly far from perfect after they've lost a pair of games in a row. But I still think this is a team that's very much right there. And even if people are tired of me kind of defending this team, um, I'm going to continue for now to go against the, the consensus grain on them where this is kind of the people's punching bag right now. But let's move on. The Cowboys at number 11, staying put. Um, a weird game against Pittsburgh where Dak actually impressed me in a night where he turned the ball over three times. Weird. Like those three, three plays from Dak were very ugly. A bad sack fumble, a couple of bad interceptions, but overall, there's no way they win that game without Dak Prescott. And he's kind of the sole defense of why this team should be ranked 11th right now. Like, that was just a very professional win where he comes in with a game plan very similar to uh, week one against Cleveland, where they knew they couldn't really hold up. They had to get that ball out quickly. And there's just not a lot of quarterbacks that can. <laughs> I almost said execute a game plan like that without making too many mistakes. Dak really, you know, toted the line in terms of making mistakes, but still impressive for him to be able to find those holes, get that ball out quickly, knowing he was going to get heated up against the rush. It was a very high difficulty outing for Dak. You were going to get some volatility, um, you know, in in that matchup, but he, he did impress me. So they do have that going for them, but... With that said, like they still can't really run the ball. They keep losing guys on the D line. It's they're they're going through a lot of stuff right now. Huge for them to just survive that week after the weather delay. And and I think them staying put at eleven is symbolic of that word there, survival. They're hanging around, but do they really have the upside of a top tier team? I don't think they've they've shown that at this point. And then at number ten, the Green Bay Packers. Uh, kind of a survival week for them too. I, they they are still very much figuring themselves out in so many ways. I think on both sides of the ball. I mean, Jordan Love, I feel like, has still not really settled in. That second half of the Rams game definitely definitely felt uh, at least a, a performance that you can hope as a Packers fan that he's kind of back, used to the speed of the game, comfortable with his knee again. Where in the second half of that game, he was he was accurate, he was precise, he didn't make those big mistakes that he's been making a lot of this year. Um, but the first half of that game was just erratic for Jordan Love. I have no idea why he threw that deep ball to Jaden Reed. Just a very Brett Farvian F it ball. If you're going to throw that ball, you might as well throw it on the money, which he did. But I, I just, I, I can't believe he threw it. Um, easily could have been intercepted if the if the db just turns his head around um and then of course the the pick um you know for the for the touchdown at the before half was was just laughable so you know love has just had a very roller coaster season with the injury and the turnover worthy play stuff but then making some really good plays too it's just been 
really wild and tough to know what what he is moving forward right now we're, we're gonna have to just continue to evaluate that but i do love his resiliency as he showed last year when things go wrong he's able to settle back in and and you know raise that baseline of play a lot of jordan love talk there but i feel like the rest of the offensive structure is pretty good it's just he keeps mixing it up all over the place and, and i didn't even mention the accuracy which is just that's my main concern honestly on jordan love just has not has not been putting the ball on dudes consistently this year but defensively they're very much figuring themselves out too i i think jeff halfley can actually dial up a nasty blitz when they need it um, but the run defense and the down to down consistency for them has not been there the pass rush on that d line is not what they thought it would be rushing for they've had the blitz to get after the quarterback and you hope that was going to change this week against the rams o-line it really didn't they had a blitz to heat up matthew stafford and, and they were just dependent on turnovers in this game i don't know if you can continue to count on uh, an interception from Xavier McKinney every single week. Eventually, that's going to stop. But uh, what a signing that's been. Um, yeah, they're they're a talented team, a young team, a very turbulent 3-2 and two start to the season. Just hoping they can kind of settle in and we can learn a little bit more about who the Packers really are because I still don't feel like I have a great idea uh, to that answer right now. Then the Philadelphia Eagles at number nine, coming off the bye week, should be getting healthier here. I, I don't know the exact status of Lane Johnson, A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, um, but they obviously are a better football team when those guys are playing, despite my concerns about Jalen Hurts. If you haven't checked out my Jalen Hurts video, I encourage you to do it. I'm very proud of it. Um, but yeah, Eagles gaining a spot, basically jumping the Jets, um, who continue to struggle a little bit. Um, then the commanders at number eight, God, what a skyrocket it's been. I mean, this was, I mean, I've already done my apologizing. Uh, I'm totally happy to apologize about it because this team is so fun to watch. Jaden Daniels is so fun to watch. I just did not think this version of the commanders was possible. Did I think it was possible that Jaden Daniels could surprise us and this team could win some games with, with the offense and, you know, maybe be a scrappy five and six, you know, five or six win team that we get excited about for next season. Sure. I, I was low on the commanders. I, I probably wouldn't have bet on that, but I think that was maybe possible for them to be like world beaters through five weeks, having a historic offense an offense that's so good that you don't even have to worry about their, their defense being pretty bad. I just, it's so, so surprising for me. I mean, Cliff Kingsbury has been an excellent play caller. These running backs deserve a lot of credit. The offensive line deserves a lot of credit. Just, a, a, you know, a, a credit pizza getting distributed across the whole locker room and Jaden Daniels gets the biggest slice. Doing it and doing it against the Bengals and the Cardinals defenses was one thing, but doing it in Cleveland against that pass rush, just another box checked for these guys. So the, the skyrocketing continues. I'm not quite ready to go Super Bowl contender on the Commanders. I'm just not. Some Commanders fans might be wanting me to go there. We'll, we'll see. If they keep playing like this, we'll reach that point for sure. But I do still have some questions about the defensive talent uh, and what they're going to look like when they don't face Deshaun Watson. Uh, but Dan Quinn's getting those guys to, to play hard uh, for what it's worth. But let's go ahead and turn to our top tier where I do have the Buffalo Bills. I feel like this is partially my fault. I ranked them number one and praised everything that was going on and said I was dead wrong about predicting a fall off season for the Bills in which I predicted them to miss the playoffs and to finally fire Sean McDermott. Well, through three, re uh, th through three weeks, I looked like an idiot for that take. Now it's like taking a U-turn back in that direction and you have a lot of worries about the Bills. I do think some of these defenses have figured out some of the stuff they wanted to do. The Texans really had these receivers uh, tightly covered all game long. It put a lot of pressure on Josh Allen. And then Josh Allen, under that pressure, didn't have the best game. I mean, the stat sheet was brutal. What was it, like 9 for 30? Uh, watching the game, it actually felt like he played a little bit better than that. But they're going to have to get back to the drawing board uh, offensively and, and defensively. They actually were, were fine on the defensive side of the ball. I think they got the most out of the group they had, um, but they're just so outmanned defensively. These safeties feel very slow and just bad. Give up the big touchdown to Nico Collins there. And the pass rush um, actually, again, played like okay this week against Houston, but 
you know, with Von Miller suspended and uh, Ed Oliver's been beat up this year, it's just they they don't have all the bodies they need defensively. So I still like the Bills. I know that was a lot of negative talk. Uh, I don't just ignore the first three weeks, and I think they can find some answers and get some of that mojo back. They definitely missed Khalil Shakir in this game too. It is, though, going to come down to Josh Allen playing like the Josh Allen of the first three weeks of the season. I think he's capable of it. That's why they're in this tier. Um, but if they can't find that version of Josh Allen immediately, this team is going to run in, into some troubles, and, and the losing might not stop here. So they're going to find themselves at the bottom of the, the deep playoff contender tier this week. They got the Jets this Monday night. Um, another big test for them coming up. Then the Niners uh, at number six. I mean, I would love to have one of those crazy stats websites that could tell you if a two and three football team has ever been the betting favorite to win their conference and second in the NFL to win the Super Bowl. Like, clearly, the rational people that are putting their money on the NFL still believe this Niners team is a great team and going to be a serious threat to go on a deep playoff run. And I still believe that too. But at some point, they got to start winning games, right? They're, they're falling three spots this week. I'm not going to panic in this loss against the Cardinals, where they did feel like the better team for the vast majority of the game. But just, just like the Rams game, critical mistakes late in the game allow them to blow the game. And that's really what all you're hoping it is, is you made some mistakes, uh, stuff you can clean up. You get a kicker back, you know, Jake Moody looks like he's going to miss a few weeks. He'll probably pick someone up, but someone that can actually kick field goals. Um, that was a big factor in this game. And then, you know, Jordan Mason, you know, in his first year really starting games here, he's, he's got to hold that ball tight. You can't fumble late in the game like that. So they made mistakes. They lose a game that they probably should have won. Am I really worried about the Niners? Not yet, but man, you just, you got to close games. I think this team has earned the benefit of the doubt that they'll get this thing straightened out. Um, but a, a big test in Seattle Thursday night football here coming coming right up. But then the Houston Texans at number five, they're going to go up two here. Man, four and one really couldn't feel any better for you as a Texans fan because I just I still don't think this team is playing up to their potential, which sounds crazy at four and one, but. I still don't think they've had a week this year where like both sides of the ball are clicking full cylinder. You know, in this game, the, the defense really did. I, I think the defense probably had their most impressive game start to finish in this one. Really just the one big, um, you know, touchdown to Keon Coleman was a, was the problem in this game. But um, beyond that, I, I think their coverage and pass rush had their best day. But as that happens, the offense in the fourth quarter kind of like self imploded. I think CJ Stroud has more than earned the benefit of one bad quarter. Uh, he really has been the reason they're four and one this year. I've been just blown away with CJ Stroud, but he did have a bad pick and a bad fumble to kind of let the Bills back into this game. So it's like, uh, and, and Nico Collins gets, gets hurt after that big touchdown. Um, I think it's a testament to just all of the different pockets of talent that this team has and really how balanced they can be. It's just one side steps, you know, one, one side screws up and someone else is able to step up and compensate for that, if that makes sense. So it's like, if they can get all these things clicking together, this team can really be a Super Bowl caliber team. It's good to have the ability for one side to pick the other up, um, but it's also great when you can just get everything firing all together and really feel like a world beater, which they don't yet. But they have a lot of different ways to win football games right now, and I still think it's early in the season and, and they can get better. Exciting win to beat the Bills at home. Then your weekly question of where are the Vikings ranked? I've got them fourth this week. It's it's just tough. Um it's just, if, if we're trying to get this team ranked inside the top three right now, it's just tough. There's some damn good football teams um, still to come here. But, I mean, this Vikings defense especially, it's just unbelievable what Brian Flores is doing. The last four weeks, Kyle Shanahan, Stroud and Slowick, Lafleur and Love, and now just completely baffling Aaron Rodgers who had no answers for this defense in the first half of the game. You know, I think teams, 
in the second half of games, especially the Packers and the Jets, it's like once they kind of absorb this blitz crazy attack and make some mistakes, they're able to come up with some answers uh, to it. But the ability to get these big leads early, it's just a complete testament to the preparation and the scheme that they're running that is just completely baffling these quarterbacks and offensive coordinators right now. It's so impressive. Now, this is the second week in a row where if the Vikings offense looked a little bit better and I felt a little bit better about Sam Darnold, I maybe would push them over a team like the Chiefs or the Ravens or the Lions who are yet to come. The Vikings offense really did struggle in this game. Second week in a row where it feels like Sam Darnold is not regressing all the way back to the old Sam Darnold, but some of those aspects of his game are in there. Um, He's missed some throws, some of these deep outs, and he has the interception sailing the throw over the middle. The first three weeks, he was like elite accuracy. It's taken a step back a little bit on some of these big third down throws. Aaron Jones gets banged up in this game. That's not going to be great for their run game. And when you really boil it down the last two weeks, and especially the last six quarters of football, the offense is actually kind of struggling right now. So, yes, the Vikings are 5-0. and They're massively impressive. If any of these other top teams had lost, they would have continued to climb even higher. But they are getting a plus two this week. And uh, I guess Vikings fans will just have to let me hear it yet again if you think she'd be ranked higher, or just let me know if you think four is fair for Minnesota, who... Gets to 5-0 and on their bye week. Who would have thought it? But then at number three, another 5-0 and team, the Kansas City Chiefs. Very impressive night for them. And I even thought about having them pass back up the Ravens or the Lions. We'll see how next week goes. I think I'm pretty close to that. Obviously, these teams are all very tightly knit. Uh, but I was impressed by the Chiefs. And I, I just think it was a thought I had going into this game that I was curious to see. You know, they really were kind of force-feeding Rasheed Rice and just running the ball and counting on the defense. It didn't feel like Mahomes was really locked in or feeling like he had to do anything too special. Um, And with how well Rice was playing, Andy Reid didn't have to mix and match things too much. But he goes down, and it felt like the Chiefs' offense actually got better. Mahomes, to me, was just so much sharper in this game so much more dialed in and felt like he knew he had to be the best player on the offense can't just throw slants and bubble screens and dump downs to Rasheed Rice and as a result the offense just felt better and more scary as what tends to happen when Patrick Mahomes takes over a football game so just so impressed there and they were just they were getting guys open at the second level like Juju Smith-Schuster becoming a factor also having to lean more on Travis Kelsey might be a good thing for the Chiefs offense. It felt like first five weeks, they were kind of doing the Tim Duncan thing with him. It's like, yeah, we got other players. Don't worry about it, Travis. You can hang out, stay healthy. And here we go. Week five, they're all out of weapons. And all right, Travis, you got to be a lead again. And he says, all right, I got you. We're good. So definitely the best the Chiefs offense has felt to me. They should have had way more points too. Kind of a sloppy turnover at the one yard line I'm not going to hold that against them too much to Juju um, you know in his first game back on the on the Chiefs really playing significant playing time and the missed field goal as well so they still blew out the Saints but it could have been it could have been over a whole quarter sooner right it could have been 36 to 13 Uh, so very impressive night and the Chiefs defense just continues to be outstanding as well their their improvements in the run defense that we really saw in the playoffs last year. So the Chiefs were like 27th in run defense DVOA last year, maybe even lower in the regular season. But once the playoffs hit, they really bunkered down and were dominant there. Question was, you know, was that going to continue this year or not? They've been one of the best run defenses in all of football out the gate this year. And that's just raising the floor for the defense because last year it was like, well, you can't pass on them, but at least you can run on them. This year, there's really no answers. So definitely feeling a lot more complete, even with potentially less playmakers for the Chiefs. But even if they impressed, I'm not quite ready to push them over the Ravens when Lamar Jackson is playing like this. And this is where it gets really scary for the Ravens because, you know, the first two weeks were a little rocky. They were fine, but a little rocky. Um, 
they have the Dallas game, and then they have the Bills game where they're like, well, we've got all these tight ends. We've got Derrick Henry, Lamar Jackson. Let's just run the ball and beat teams to death that way. Well, here against the Bengals, granted it was the Bengals defense that's really poor, but these were not easy plays that Lamar Jackson had to make. These were not easy reads. The Bengals were actually getting a bit of a pass rush on Lamar. But for them to have a different answer in the sense of, okay, we're down 10 points in the fourth quarter. We need Lamar to be the MVP and just beat teams with the drop back passing game. Can he do it? And the answer in this game was absolutely yes. I mean, I just got to say, man, his pocket presence paired with his elite athleticism, I don't know how you stop it. His ability to feel the rush, elude the rush, and navigate that pocket to find these throwing windows, it's just insane. So the fact that they have this kind of core identity with this run game and Charlie Kolar breaking out and the, the 12 personnel, the 21 personnel, all the different kind of old Greg Roman influences getting put into this Todd Monken version of this offense. I mean, they ran four verticals out of 22 personnel in this game, which was really fun. Two tight ends, a fullback, and a running back on the field, and they're threatening, threatening you vertically with a guy like Charlie Kolar. It's just they're doing some really fun stuff with the threat of that run game. But then it's like, okay, but we can also just, you know, counting on, count on Lamar to be a superhero when we need it the most. You don't want that every single snap because I think the the offensive line is volatile and they don't have enough receivers to come out in 11 personnel and do that every single time. But um, the fact that it's in their back pocket and they can do it because of Lamar, it's, it's just so, so special. And then defensively, I do think they have better weeks ahead. They got Joe Burrowed in this one. They've been so good this year, other than some coverage bust week one with a new coordinator that you'll you'll live with. I'm not going to panic um, against that opponent when they have their backs against the wall um, and they bunker down at the end of the game too. So I do think the, the Ravens defense will have better days ahead of them, but obviously if if they're if they're getting beat big chunk plays every week, we'll we'll have to you know readdress that. But I'm not quite going to worry about that after this week. I think they're playing really well. And uh, it's, it's honestly a testament to them to keep the number two spot when you have teams like the Vikings and the Chiefs undefeated that I still think the Ravens are better than. On a, on a, if they played on a neutral field this week, Ravens-Chiefs, Ravens-Vikings, I would take the Ravens. And that's how I do my power rankings. Um, and that is why I do have the Detroit Lions number one. Tough on a week where all these last three teams won. It's tough for that recency bias not to overload you but you got to remember the last game the lions played i mean this offense looked unstoppable and i do think from a talent perspective they just have something really that i mean does anybody maybe the eagles if jalen hurts can figure it out but they don't have the play caller that the lions have i mean the lions it's not that jared goff is elite but he's something close to a top 10 quarterback right now and that's their biggest weakness like they just they really feel like they clicked in in that last game so coming off the bye week we'll see if that continues and, and the defense really has been good three out of four weeks as well so um yeah not a ton to add on detroit other than hey they're they're i still have a lot of confidence in them in a week where the three teams ranked behind them also had great weeks so you guys will have to let me know if uh, if that's stupid or not. But uh, that, that is what we're going to have here for the Week 6 Power Rankings. Uh, I really hope you guys enjoyed. Please do hit that like button on the way out. And if you enjoy my analysis, uh, I do want to remind you, I have my weekly game recap episodes of the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. You can find the YouTube channel for that or just search the um, title there wherever you get your audio podcasts. You'll get a little bit more thorough reactions to all these games than more of the snapshot version from this video. But yeah, that's going to do it. Let me know your thoughts down below and we'll see you later. Peace out. <laughs>